My name's Steve Piccolo. I teach what they call sound design here at Naba, which is, I've always thought was kind of a funny thing to do. And it would be like if we took at the conservatory, everybody studies sound. Sound has so many different aspects to it. And then maybe in the conservatory they could have one course called visual design. It would be ridiculous, but that's what we do with sound. We have one course. It's not design at all, actually. It's more sound studies, I think, would be a better word for it, because we're trying to do everything that's not music, but has to do with sound. Music could be in it, too. The problem with this course is that sound design and sound studies in general is not a discipline. It's a completely undisciplined discipline. It's a discipline that we have to invent for ourselves almost. All the people who do it professionally are kind of borrowed from other fields. Their training was not really as sound designers. They're musicians who evolved into uh, work with sound that is not specifically music or their uh, photographers who began to capture sounds with their cameras, people who do different things and somehow they find themselves doing this job which is not even a well-defined job, nobody knows what it is. I was talking with Matthew Herbert the other day, who's a great DJ and uh, manipulator of found sounds, and he was saying the same thing, we have to find a way to teach people, starting with some basic building blocks. I mean, if you're an architect, for example, you know that there are some really basic things you have to learn how to do, how to draw, how to think about structures. There's Vitruvius, there's uh, the treatises from the Renaissance, things that you can look at. Sound is a completely new discipline because it's only been about 100 years that people could actually record a sound. So, we don't have records of what happened in the past. We only know about scores. Musical scores are this really limited language. It's on a pentagram. There are little black dots on it. It's a language that people around the world could learn and could share, but only because it was limited to a very small range of things with respect to the whole universe of sound. So we're thinking, what are these basic building blocks? What is the... what could the discipline be. And in the end I thought maybe the most interesting, like the starting point of sound is the little kid who's going broom broom with his car, you know, broom, broom, broom. what's this kid doing exactly? He's using sound not to communicate. This is a big error. I think people always think art is about communication. It's not about communication. It's more about deciphering your universe, decoding the world around you, all the sensory stimuli that you're getting. The only way to do it is to imitate them. Kids imitate sounds and assign them to objects. This goes gloop gloop, this goes nyam nyam, this goes brum brum. Which is exactly what people were always doing. I mean, think about you're in the jungle, you're really primitive, you know, Neanderthal or something. <clears throat> You don't even have language yet. Language is like really something evolved in the far distant future. Why do you make sounds? Well, partially, I think you do it in order to sort of take possession of your environment. Also, you do it to check out the space you're in. You've entered a dark cave and you want to know how big it is, if it's a good place to live or not. So you go, hey! And now, even now, when I did this, hey, you can hear how big the room is because your ears are incredibly sensitive. They're really good at making really fast calculations of distance where my voice is reflecting off the walls over here. So you're probing space with sound and you're probing time because in a primitive uh, situation of life, people didn't have clocks, you know, and Time was a really elastic concept. In a cave it was dark. You didn't even know if it's daytime or nighttime, what it is. 
sound has this great capacity to measure time because it takes place in time, which is completely different from all visual art. So what's the moment when this stuff starts to happen? What, what is our basic building block? The guys in the jungle out there, maybe they have to kind of rehearse their hunting scene or something. They have these propitiatory rituals that they conduct. One of the sounds in the ritual is probably going to be boing, the sound of a bow being pulled, you know, to shoot an arrow at a woolly mammoth or something. The sound is pretty striking, it's pretty interesting, it's going to have to be a part of my reenactment of the hunt, especially if I don't have words to use. So I'm going to put that in there, boing, every once in a while I'm going to put it into the narrative. I'm going to use sound because sound is something that helps people to work together, to be coordinated, and that's what, you know, music is all about, but it's also why you call a concert a concert, because it's concerted effort of some kind. Even in military situations, what do they do to get people to work together and to obey orders? They make them march and sing together, because music somehow unites them. It's the same reason why Japanese companies in the morning, you have to sing the company song and do your uh, exercises. So the, we're out in the jungle, we're going boing with our bow, which is just like the little kid going broom broom with his car. And uh, then one day somebody decides to put uh, the bow on top of a table or on top of something else, and it sounds better. And that's the beginning of the violin, basically. What's a violin? It's a guy, he's not going broom broom anymore, he's saying, Whoa, you hear this cool sound I can make with the string on a wooden box? If you ever see a berimba, which is a Brazilian instrument, it's a bow. It, it's an archer's bow with a dry gourd attached to it as a resonating chamber. So then let's go a little bit further along with evolution. At a certain point we start to get language. We've been going broom broom for a long time. We want some way to represent it. And my hypothesis is the place that we should start with all this is with letters, because letters are actually uh, these little packages, which are the first place where a, a pictogram, a sound that you make with your voice, the sound of uh, writing, and a meaning all come together in a little package. And there, it's a package that's born completely without any separation between visual art, sound art, dance, music, all these other categories that we made up later. It's kind of a primordial synesthesia that is completely fascinating to me. One thing that all people use Western alphabets probably are not aware of is that each of those letters was a picture when it began. An A was a bull, and the, the two prongs of the A were the horns of the bull. Then the A got turned over because when they started to write from right to left, no, from left to right instead of right to left, the letters switched around. B is the home of the bull. It's a little two-bedroom two house, like a trulo or something, and so on and so forth. We use these letters, the letters even today continue to have some of the sound things that went together, like S is teeth. To say S we have to put our teeth together. Right? There's, a, there's something that survived from the earliest moment of language all the way to today. We use these letters all the time and we have no idea what they mean, actually. So. That might be the sort of place where you could start and say, let's make the building blocks of this stuff that they call sound design or sound studies. I think if we don't go back that far, we're not going to ever be able to really make this into a discipline or something that can be really encoded. Because if we use sound to decode the universe, we also use it to encode the universe 
it has to work both ways. And so I think in about 50 years, we're going to have a really great sound design course here in Nava.